Coming up on Market to Market. The survey says bankers are cautious in 2021. Why? Bringing rural, urban, and downstream parties together on Nutrient Exchange. And market analysis with Matthew Bennett, next. It's really good cash prices, so. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, November 20 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. A stroll down the aisles of a physical store would lead you to believe Christmas time is here. Retailers are trying to get back some of the happiness and cheer as October's numbers appear to be signaling a cautious consumer. An increase of three-tenths of a percent was reported by the Commerce Department, but was slower than September's gain. Housing starts jumped almost 5 percent as this sector remains hot. Low interest rates continue to be a driving factor. Tyson Foods reported the company's net income nearly doubled in the fourth quarter. Later in the week, the corporation was served with a lawsuit over employees betting on the number of coronavirus cases at the Waterloo, Iowa plant. The November Rural Main Street Index declined for the first time since April as it retreated below growth neutral. This and other surveys are snapshots mixing data and sentiment. The American bankers released their look at 2021 for rural America. Peter Tubbs examines the findings. Multiple years of low farm commodity prices have compressed the profitability of America's farms, according to the 2020 Agricultural Lending Survey, a joint project of the American Bankers Association and the Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation, commonly known as Farmer Mac. I think the ag lenders uh, all across the country are, are really tuned in to the performance of their borrowers. And I think uh, several years of lower commodity prices have really impacted ag lenders' uh, um, attitudes and expectations about the performance of both the loan portfolios as well as the ag economy in general. A majority of U.S. agricultural lenders saw profitability decline among farm operations and are estimating only 51% of farm borrowers will be profitable in 2020, down six percentage points when compared to last year. Nearly half of all agricultural lenders aren't expecting any kind of improvement in 2021 and believe grain, dairy, and cattle sectors are under the most pressure. Those banks participating in the survey noted 87% of borrowers increased their dependence on government subsidies. Lenders stressed that the loss of cash support from Washington would reduce farm profitability. Farmer Mac sees taking the long view with farm borrowers in 2021. Producers looking at their 2021 budgets may see tight margins, and some are exploring restructuring their financial situation. 20% of borrowers asked for loan modifications in 2020. Lenders are seeing that uptick in demand. A lot of that has to do with a restructuring the balance sheet, uh, taking some of the equity out, putting it back into working capital. The survey was conducted in August and early September before the recent run-up in commodity market prices and may have an overly dark view of the agricultural economy in the short run. But long-term concerns about farm profitability remain. Lenders believe the demand side of the market equation offers the most hope for improving profitability. How are we going to increase demand for agricultural products and how are we going to support that demand all the way through the markets? That's really where you get long-term growth and, and increase in profitability levels long-term. It's going to be those broader questions that ag lenders are, are definitely tapping into throughout this survey. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs.
Presidential transitions are filled with last-minute efforts to address campaign promises or leave final edicts on priorities. Environmentalists are watching this White House for changes to protections currently on the books. The health of rivers and streams are key to those making a living off of the water. Josh Bittner has more in our cover story. The boat has been slow. My catering operation is pretty much non-existent. You don't have the corporate events, you don't have the weddings and things like that. Charlie Kretzinger's Dubuque, Iowa business was hit hard by the economic side effects of COVID-19. Income streams like river cruises are anchored to his restaurant, Catfish Charlie's, located on the banks of the Mississippi River, which specializes in fresh river-caught cuisine. You got the filet on the back here? Right around the front, we call them collars. So we're gonna saute some of that up in a uh, white wine clam sauce. Obviously we shut down the restaurant for what, six, seven, eight weeks, I can't remember, but we did to-go orders. And that was slow. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of to-go orders compared to what we normally do, but you can't do that type of volume. You're selling food, now you're not selling a drink with it. Kretzinger works with local fishermen who catch carp and catfish under a commercial license permitted by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. That's our Cajun catfish with a Cajun shrimp creole. We take catfish to another level, and we're proud of our catfish. While a fresh Iowa catch matters to local economies of scale, state officials estimate the value of all fish and their eggs along Big Muddy's Iowa coast at just $600,000 annually. American lady out. That's a drop in the bucket compared to the $320 million the Hawkeye State rakes in licensing half a million anglers every year. Iowa DNR says around 180 Iowa licensed commercial fishermen and helpers work the Mississippi River every year, though few as their sole means of employment. But their profits and Kretzinger's are tied in part to the health of the river. In Dubuque County, we have a lot of uh, highly erodible land stream bank erosion, the more sediment we can keep out of our streams, it's huge for aquatic life, uh, the Mississippi River, and so forth. Northeast Iowa farmers and conservationists have joined forces in the past to address land-related water quality and habitat issues. An ambitious new approach looks to build on that heritage by dovetailing into a larger proactive environmental framework. The city of Dubuque was the first city in the state of Iowa to enter an MOU with the DNR as it relates to kind of the process of how the nutrient reduction exchange would work. Eric Schmeckel is watershed program director with Dubuque Soil and Water Conservation District. Through a first of its kind agreement, the district has teamed up with city, county, and state government to implement the Iowa Nutrient Exchange Project. And officials in Dubuque say a handful of other Iowa cities and towns would like to adopt a similar approach. It is not a law, it's a, it's a voluntary approach from the city of Dubuque and the Iowa DNR to say, let's try and develop a collaboration, a partnership with uh, point source and non-point source water permits that look at how we can work together to improve water quality. Dubuque's Urban Rural Pact builds upon the state's Nutrient Reduction Strategy, or NRS. First enacted in 2013, the guidelines are designed to combat Iowa's alleged disproportionate contribution to the weather, chemical, land, and water use cocktail downed by the Mississippi River and delivered into the Gulf of Mexico. The resulting oxygen-deprived or hypoxic region, more commonly known as the dead zone, has been plagued by seasonal runoff-fed algae growth. This year, scientists measured the area, incapable of supporting aquatic life, at over 2,000 square miles. Environmental critics say Iowa's goal to reduce nutrient flows by 45 percent has no teeth. But Schmeckel says his NRS-aligned conservation work with upstream farmers goes further with an alternative to expensive environmental compliance for municipal utilities tasked with shaving wastewater output of nitrogen and phosphorus to 66 and 75 percent, respectively. Let's say he wants to convert a field to no-till, or he wants to put a buffer in along a stream. We then model those practices on his field stream 
using what's called a nutrient tracking tool. We get then outputs of what those reductions are as for both phosphorus and nitrogen. We enter those outputs into a, a federal database that the DNR then checks and then the city of Dubuque can claim some of that credit back into their permit. So I got uh, 17 different species growing in here to try to stimulate my biology. Cover crops have become an important piece of the financial puzzle for Eric Miller, who raises row crops outside Cascade, Iowa. The longer you can keep a living root in the soil, the quicker it's going to change the soil. His plants sequester carbon, build beneficial bacteria to boost traditional commodity yields, and in some cases, bring value-added returns from niche markets. Just this past year, we started uh, malting our own grains, growing and malting uh, barley here for local breweries. It's almost like a side effect, the better water quality. Miller says the deeper roots scavenge for nutrients corn and soybeans can't reach, and during rain events, his soil now sponges up and slows down stormwater runoff. He tracks the field data and says he's been able to slice pest and disease control expenses as well. Anytime there's nutrients leaving our farm, that's money leaving our farm. This is a way for me to kind of take control of my input costs, um, improve my bottom line. Considering the sheer volume of regional agricultural products that move down the upper Mississippi corridor, Miller says Iowa's number one export is still topsoil and endless work remains. Charlie Kretzinger's primary bounty of bottom feeders might be at home in the muck downstream, but the former farm kid deeply appreciates Dubuque County's stewardship strides. Anything we can do in the United States to keep things cleaner and better is a beautiful thing. And farming's big business, so when you take ground away from them guys, it hurts them, you know? We're asking them to do things to keep our world a better place. They should be paid for that. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market report. The return of curfews and shutdowns for Main Street businesses to stem COVID-19 spread weighed on the trade for the week. September wheat dropped a quarter cent, while the nearby corn contract added 13 cents. The South American weather report turning wetter tempered some of this week's soybean rally. The January soybean contract jumped 33 cents. December soybean meal increased 660 per ton. March cotton gained 256 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, December class three milk futures declined to $1.70. A mixed week in the livestock sector. February cattle lost $1.58. January feeders declined by 90 cents, and the February lean hog contract improved 77 cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index shed 37 ticks. December crude oil improved $1.98 per barrel. Comex gold decreased 12.40 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs commodity index increased almost eight points to finish at 372.20. Joining us now to give us some insight is regular market analyst. His name is Matthew Bennett. Hello, Matthew. Hey, it's good to see you, Paul. Good to see you, Matt. Um, I'm going to start with wheat just for the sense of we talked about weather in South America. We're also watching weather in the plains. There's forecast for rain this weekend there. But there's also a global story going on here in wheat. Which one's winning out, do you think, and, and keeping the market at bay? Weather domestically or a bigger global story? Well, you know, I think that the wheat market probably would have more excitement if Australia had had uh, weather issues like they had the last three or four years. I mean, they finally caught a break this year, you know, and they had a pretty good crop putting wheat out on the world export market is tempering prices a little bit. But, you know, six dollar wheat out to July is actually fairly priced. I think, in my opinion, if you would rally corn and beans sharply uh, from this point forward, which some people feel like that that could happen, I could see wheat trending higher. But by all means, we have to keep an on what's going on in the Plain States. I've talked quite a bit lately about the fact that the uh, uh, the National Drought Monitor looks fairly similar right now as what it did in the fall of 2011. And so I'm not saying we're going to have another 2012, but certainly if you go into the uh, into the winter dry, a lot of times you can really struggle to break out of that pattern. And so uh, we got to keep a very close eye on that moving forward. There's also uh, folks that get concerned uh, in other areas that if they are dry, and that would have been a bigger problem this year had we been dry going into the growing season. So right now, 
Are you holding on some, let's say, nearby on, on, on weed? Are you making a sale right now? And what's your price target? You know, in my opinion, I, I like I said, I feel like we're fairly priced. If I sell some wheat in this uh, uh, level, my opinion would be to go long, uh, uh, you know, a limited risk position would make sense, especially given the angst that we have uh, about the corn and bean markets. Because I feel like wheat at this stage of the game, this point in the year, is probably going to be more of a follower. So I wouldn't say I'm bearish wheat necessarily, but if I'm selling, I probably would uh, put something out there in a limited risk scenario. All right, sounds uh, like something that some are maybe going to do as uh, we close today at 5.99 and a half on that uh, March contract. Let's go December corn right now. And this corn market, I mean, you, you alluded to it twice there, the relationship between corn, soybeans, and wheat. What is the wheat story into corn? What's the biggest uh, connector? Which one's pulling the other one right now? Is corn leading wheat? I've got to think that corn is actually uh, uh, there for a long time. Corn was kind of following soybeans, in my opinion. And then corn uh, basically decided to get an identity of its own. And I think a couple of different things are going on. Certainly, uh, dryness in South America is weighing into both the corn and bean market. Whenever you see the Ukraine crop was downgraded the way that it was in the November report. And then you continue to see things like we saw Friday morning with over 300,000 metric ton of sales. Uh, some of those were to wink, wink, unknown. And we've got to think that that's probably China, uh, you know, and there's a lot of rhetoric out there just guessing how much is China going to purchase. Uh, some of the people that we talked to are thinking it could be that 22 million metric ton or even in excess, uh, as the FAS said. So it would be very interesting moving forward. But I think corn's kind of working on its own at this stage of the game. Uh, and if you watch, the wheat market probably won't fall dramatically as long as the corn market stays supported. It's got a little bit of support there, as you said. Yes. Uh, what about that carry out number? Uh, for corn. Is that a, a big factor or is it still just about China? Well, Paul, whenever you look at the fact that w in August, uh, the USDA was 2.75 you know, uh, for this marketing year. Right now we're 1.7. In three months, we dropped 1 billion bushels. Obviously, we lost some uh, bushels due to the quarterly stocks number getting adjusted lower. It's something I was calling for for quite some time. Me and my team felt like uh, USDA might have been a little heavy on the 2019 crop. Uh, you could call it what you want, but regardless, we're a billion bushels what we less than what we were three months ago. How heavily does that weigh in? Well, in my opinion, I still think there's some work to do on the export front. Uh, I don't think the crop's going to get any bigger as far as this year is concerned. And so 1.7 might be a touch rich. I know the last time I was on here, whenever I was on with Naomi and Ted and Elaine, you know, I, I suggested that we would be below 2 billion, you know, on, on, on this November report. And a couple of them were like, what? You know, it, but, but I think uh, they also agreed and, and it, that, that we would get there. It's just nobody really thought that it was going to happen this quickly. Right, and, and that brings up, you bring up a couple of points there, uh, acreage battle. We have some great questions that we're going to get to in Market Plus and also some Twitter conversations that you've been having since, uh, we, since we recorded here. So I want to get into the acreage battle in the Market Plus, the podcast or the video form there. But I need to ask real quickly on corn before we move on, are you selling right now? Are you holding out for a little something more and what's that target? You know, the corn market, in my opinion, uh, we've had such a good run. I think we're kind of, you get up above 435 and it seemed like we've kind of bumped up on a little bit of resistance here. Uh, as a producer, I've got to ask myself with a really strong basis uh, what I'm waiting on. I have no issue with the producer selling. If they do, I want to retain ownership though. If the corn is in the bin at home, I kind of like the physical commodity. I think it's got a lot of value. I think people are going to really be hunting for the corn. But as far as if it's in the elevator, I'm probably going to be a little bit more of a seller there, uh, re-own that with a limited risk strategy because I've got to think corn ownership is a good thing for the time being until we figure out what South America is going to look like and just how much the Chinese are going to purchase. How much more are the Chinese going to purchase in beans and what's that impact on the trade going forward? Well, you know, the interesting thing on beans is that, you know, you come in here with a 190 carryout, you drop 100 million bushels and the exports weren't even touched. And some people felt like that if you got that number down enough, that some of that was going to be due to export. So uh, whenever you lost it all due to production and no export adjustment, it's kind of exciting uh, how much more the Chinese are going to purchase. And I think that's part of the reason why this South American weather is so important. You know, if the Brazilians are not able to export as much as what China uh, would like to see, there's 
there's no doubt in my mind, uh, if this weather doesn't change significantly in the next few weeks, the Chinese are going to just continue to purchase U.S. soybeans. So, uh, you know, I, in my opinion, I think moving forward, it's a tight situation that's probably going to get oh, just a little bit tighter yet. We have a question from Phil in Dresden, Ontario, Canada, and it's you kind of alluded to it a little bit about looking backwards and if we knew what we talked about then, what we know now. Phil's asking, the upper grain price levels have defied logic in some ways. Take me back to July 30. Was it clear as a bell then? What were we thinking? What was missed? Will it be beans in the teens in January? And I'm going to let you off the hook just a tiny little bit, uh, Matt, because you were last with us in October, and we were... And you, and you said the panel was like, oh, I can't believe that number below that number. So even harder going back to July. What were the signs? Were they there at that time? Well, I mean, you wouldn't have thought that we were going to rally three dollars. If we're, we have to be completely honest about the situation. If we're going to talk a two seven five carry out in August, you know, you're looking over six hundred million for soybeans. You know, and you cut that thing. Uh, basically, you're less than twenty percent of that right now. And so, uh, Phil makes a great point. Uh, a lot has changed, though. Whenever you look at the fact we had an extremely dry August and start to September, it definitely robbed bushels for both corn and soybeans. Nobody would have thought that Ukraine was going to be exiting the export market like it had to due to the weather issues they had. And while we all felt like China was going to step in with massive purchases, they had not manifested themselves by the time July 30th rolled around. So uh, you top, uh, top all that off with dryness in South America and getting the crop planted late. And you've had a lot of things go right for us, if we're totally honest. If, if, if one or two of those things have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have had such a massive rally, but it's certainly been nice to see. All right, real quick. How much more rally is in that tank? Are we talking teens? If we are, uh, from a producer standpoint, I see no reason. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to get super bullish at $12 beans. I like selling the beans and keeping ownership once again with some sort of limited risk. I don't want to put much on the table because you know what? Three months ago, if you'd have told me $12 beans, everyone would have sold all of them. And now we've got angst about selling $12 beans. Oh, how quickly things change. And it's also changed in the livestock market. Cattle on feed report today, um, that has been an absolute up and down ride. Uh, COVID has been an impact, went away. Now you're dealing with feed input costs. What did cattle on feed quickly? On feed, 101%, placements, 89%, marketing's 99.9. What'd that report tell you? 89%, in my opinion, has got to keep me pretty hopeful on down the road. I, I think it'd be very interesting to see. I mean, obviously, you've got to balance this whole COVID fear and what, what people are going to be going out to eat or whatnot. What we found uh, back in the spring is that when they didn't, people didn't go out to eat, I think they bought even more beef to cook at home because they could afford more steak. But uh, in, bottom line, the demand's been pretty darn good. Uh, placements allow me to be pretty friendly uh, Q3 and Q4 uh, up front. Obviously, we've got some supplies to work wade through. Uh, but I guess we're kind of in the middle of a range, in my opinion. Uh, back to that low, we saw the last cattle on, uh, cattle on feed in October down around 105, and then you raced up to 116. We're kind of right in the middle of that. I can't get super friendly in the front months, but by golly, I think later on down the road, uh, you could be seeing some real excitement, especially if this vaccine comes through and you start to see people get a little more uh, excited about being able to get out and about and go out to eat and, and, and things like that. I, I do think that this beef demand is going to be very strong on down the road. What's later for you, February, March, April? Yeah, you know, for me, you get into May, June time frame, okay. and I think you could really see some strength there. All right. Uh, last week, uh, Sean Hackett, Sue Martin disagreed on the uh, direction of the hog market. And one up, one down. This week, it kind of did both. It, it went up and then it went down. That trend on the chart that we've got on the TV screen right now is headed down. Is that line going to continue lower or higher? That's a pretty tough call. You know, in my opinion, uh, last time I was on, I, you know, we were looking at some of these uh, 70s and mid 70s that we were talking about, areas we could hit up on resistance. I thought, boy, I'd be a seller in there. And I felt that way. But mid 60s, I don't know that I, I, I'm i too bearish at this stage of the game. I feel like we've gone down enough for the time being. Uh, but at the same time, I, I guess I'm not going to go out and be buying, uh, speculating on hog prices going higher. I can't get super friendly at the same time. So similar to the wheat market, I guess for me, I, I'm fairly Fairly priced at this point in the game. Well, do you buy some of the, you know, China coming back online, maybe not as much interest in the U.S. product? Is that weighing on our market? 
Yeah, I mean, you know what I'd like to see? I mean, this week, I guess, going back to cattle, you know, uh, beef uh, export sales were all-time record. And if we saw more of that, as far as pork was concerned, then I could get maybe get a little bit more friendly. You've seen flashes of it here and there. It's just we haven't seen enough consistency. Real interesting there, Matt. Uh, I know I didn't tell you I was going to ask dairy, but uh, maybe we'll talk dairy in the Market Plus. And uh, like I said, we've got some great questions coming ahead. So, Mr. Bennett, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, bud. All right. That will do it for this installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. You can watch the full show again or Market Plus on our website. That's markettomarket.org. And we do have a teensy tiny request. We'd like some space in your podcast feed. We have three different offerings. The Market Analysis, which you just heard. Market Plus, the program that you won't see on TV, that's online only. And the MTOM, that's Discussions with the Voices of Agriculture. Subscribe today to all three wherever that you download podcasts. Next week, we'll look at the economic health of rural America for all of us here. Thank you so very much for watching and have yourselves a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.